Hello everyone, thank you very much for joining uh, our session today, which is titled EU-Russia relations, how to deal with each other, question mark. Um, my name is Marila Hushcha, I'm research assistant at the International Institute for Peace and will be moderating this session today. So for a general maybe introduction, uh, we have seen that uh, Russia-EU relations lately have hit a new low. This probably started and was triggered by Alexei Navalny's um, arrest upon his return from Germany to Moscow. And subsequently, Germany was also criticized for continuing uh, its um, Nord Stream pipeline cooperation uh, with Russia. And the German government uh, reacted by saying that human rights and uh, business projects should be treated separately. Um, just um, Also just about a week ago, two weeks ago, the European High Representative for Foreign Affairs, Joseph Borrell, traveled to Moscow. Um, he visited uh, the capital, met with Russian officials, but in the European Union, uh, his trip was largely assessed as a failure. And he was actually very much criticized by the European Parliament, and some of the parliamentarians actually said that he should resign, he should resign for, um, for insufficiently strong statements, maybe. And also for the fact that while he was there, actually, European diplomats were expelled, uh, three European diplomats were expelled from uh, Russia. Um, so these are uh, small details, maybe, to a bigger story, and we will try to tackle also um, a more broader question today, which is, um, as it says in our title, how should Russia and the EU deal with each other? And is dialogue between them actually still possible? As lately it has looked like it is not. Uh, before I introduce our speakers and we go into discussion, I would like to say a couple of words in the procedure. Uh, we will have um, statements by our uh, speakers and then a discussion with the audience. So our audience can post their questions in the question and answer uh, box here on Zoom. Um, we also live stream the discussion on Facebook, so I will try to monitor uh, any comments there. So you, you can also comment on Facebook and ask your questions there. Um, and now to our speakers. Uh, I would like to start with uh, Sergei Medvedev, who is a political scientist and journalist. And until last year, he was a professor at Moscow's uh, Higher School of Economics. He also previously worked at various European think tanks and institutes, including the Vienna-based uh, Institute for Human Sciences. Uh, Sergei is also the author of a book on Russia's societal and political developments in the last decade. And the book was translated into several languages, including English, under the title, uh, The Return of the Russian Leviathan. Uh, Yulia Nikitina is our next guest from Russia. Yulia, welcome. We're glad to see you again. Um, Yulia is the Associate Professor of World Politics and Senior Research Fellow at the Center for the Euro-Asian Studies at the Moscow State University for International Affairs, MGIMO. Um, she is a specialist of security politics in Eurasia with a focus on regional organizations and Russian approaches to conflict settlement. Very um, topical issue always, so we can of course discuss also the shared neighborhood uh, between the European Union and uh, Russia today. Uh, Yulia also co-authored um, uh, a report uh, with the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung, uh, Islands of Cooperation, as well as a report with Rank, Rand uh, Corporation, uh, getting out of in-between um, perspectives on the regional order in post-Soviet Europe and Eurasia. Uh, then we also have, of course, our uh, president uh, of our institute, Hanna Svoboda, who has been for many years um, a member of the European Parliament, where he also headed the fraction of Social Democrats. And in this capacity, he also dealt a lot with uh, the European uh, foreign enlargement and neighborhood policies. So we have an excellent panel today. Unfortunately, we don't see yet our fourth speaker from Germany, but if he joins us, we can, of course, ask him and introduce him later. But so far, um, I would just like to start with the discussion and turn to Sergei at first uh, and maybe ask him um, more generally, we, we can travel these days, we know, and um, it's difficult from far away to assess the situation on the ground. So maybe if you can share just generally some words on the atmosphere in Russia in terms of also domestic situation, in terms of 
how the protests, if they're still going, um, what the reactions are in the society. Um, also, maybe it would be interesting to talk a little bit about the protests in the Far East. As far as I know, they are still also continuing. And um, overall, is it some sort of an indication of a, of a new trend of uh, Russian society changing their political views? Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be participating, to sharing views, uh, to share our views with you. Um, I would like to have some general observations on the political situation in Russia as of 2021. And I think everyone has to be very well aware that we're now facing a very different Russia. I mean, Russia 2021 is very different even from Russia 2020, let alone from Russia 2013 or Russia 2000. Uh, especially if we look at Russia 2000, uh, if we look at 20 years of Putin's presidency, this is probably 180 degrees reversal in many ways. Although we now understand that much was already being prepared in the early 2000s, but the rapid, I would say, devolution of the country and uh, this brisk turn of history is really amazing. And I, I think that uh, um, the COVID year, 2020, made a big contribution and to clarifying many political trends in the world. Uh, it was really very useful. Of course, it's a tragic year, and of course, uh, we, uh, the pandemic is still going on, uh, but it clarified many things about uh, the future trends in society, about uh, the virtualization, digitization, atomization in society. It made clear the true potential and the risks of Trumpism and the right populism, but on the other hand, also of the left movement and the BLM and so on. So by the same way, it has also clarified many things about Russia. And I think it served good in a sense of disillusionment in Russia-EU relations. Like we can no longer... Uh, hypercritically say that it's business as usual, that, you know, it's a different partner and things uh, are going all the old way. So, no, things are very different and Russia is a very different country. Uh, so, just to be square, uh, Russia is now a uh, full-fledged personalist dictatorship. We have moved towards this position uh, for a number of years. But in 2020, also using uh, the pretext of the pandemic and uh, the and putting the lid on the opposition movement, uh, the regime has consolidated itself in a constitutional manner by changing the Russian constitution. Uh, so now Putin can rule uh, for another couple of terms, basically, you know, technically, uh, for another 12 years after uh, after uh, re-election, possible re-election 2024, if he chooses. And in general, the uh, regime has been consolidated in many ways. Uh, also, it's a uh, repressive apparatus, which was also building up um, for the past several years, is now in place, uh, deployed, and quite effective, as we have seen. So I would say that 2020 is a... Um, is the end of the long period of transition which started in 2014 with the annexation of Crimea, when Russia chose uh, unilaterally to extort itself, to eject itself uh, from the world of uh, norms uh, and uh, rules and regulations, uh, starting a spiral of isolationism. And uh, this trend has ended in 2020 by consolidating this autocracy. And more generally, I think it ends the whole period of, um, you know, Putin's 20 years in office. And in a way, it's like if we look at the mirror image of Russia, I think the high point might have been 2000. So the country which Putin had inherited from Yeltsin and from uh, 15 years, slightly less, of uh, reform uh, from late Gorbachev and, uh, and Yeltsin. And then the dismantlement of this reform, uh, the dismantlement of this new globalizing open Russia with open society, it took almost 20 years. And now, in a mirror, it has taken us back something 20 years before 20, 2000. So I would say, so we are somewhere around 1980 at this point. We're in the early 1980s. And Russia today resembles me of the Soviet Union uh, of its late imperial period in many significant respects. Uh, one, it is a country 
run not just by one party, but it's a country run by the security apparatus. The real power behind uh, you know, any policy decision is the FSB, is uh, what the KGB was for the Soviet Union, so FSB is uh, today's Russia. So they're really calling all the shots. Uh, look at foreign policy, look at domestic politics. Um, you know, Russia has formal institutions. Like in appearances, this looks like a parliamentary republic, but in fact, it is not. Um, uh, Nikolai Petrov has once uh, called it, uh, so we have institutions in Russia, we have substitutions. So rather than institutions, we have substitutes of. Um, uh, be it the State Duma, be it um, the Council of the Federation, be it the ministries, the Foreign Ministry, Ministry of Economy, Council of Ministers. I mean, you open up a daily newspaper, it looks like a normal country with a normal political process going on. But in actual fact, I mean, these people are not really making the decisions, right? The decisions are made elsewhere. And uh, Russia is really driven by a very close to a very small circle of people with a very securitized isolationist mentality. And I would say the people that anticipate a war. I'm not sure, you know, what kind. I'm not in their heads. But by all appearances, Russia is now a country like the Soviet Union in 1980, preparing for a major global confrontation. So uh, the course which the country has uh, had, had taken and the rhetorics, which is used, the propaganda, uh, is really the, that of a nation which is uh, preparing itself to war. Uh, next, uh, in 1980, this is basically, um, we have, um, I wouldn't say Russia is a market economy at this point. Uh, this is a country which is run by state capitalism uh, with a huge, immense uh, percentage of uh, concentration of ownership in the same hands. Once again, closely overseeing uh, the key financial flows are overseen by the security apparatus. And the society is also organized along the allegiance to the main state corporations. We we'll have a kind of a corporate society, as the Russian sociologist Simon Kardonsky calls it, общество, the society of states. So we have something, you know, on different counts between 80 and 100 million people that are firmly anchored in the budget sphere. And uh, they are dependent on the distribution of resources from the state budget. And their political views, their allegiances are very much shaped by this fact. So Putin's contract is not just, you know, some superficial imposed upon Russia. No, I mean, it's really deeply embedded in the social structure of the Russian society, which is a society based on distribution of state resources, the distribution of the oil revenues right, which the oil rent is concentrated in the hands of one and the same elite. And, you know, the, um, the society does not really earn its living. It's basically the net recipient of the resource rent in Russia. So this is another uh, important um, similarity with the Soviet Union. Um, and finally, uh, I would say uh, international politics. I'm also once again reminded of the USSR in the 1980s when the Soviet Union had no longer the ability to constructively shape international relations, but it had a lot of destructive potential. It could ruin, it could poison, it could start a war in Afghanistan, it could still engage in a high-profile uh, nuclear standoff uh, in Europe uh, and in strategic armaments. So uh, the Soviet Union could, you know, shoot down the South Korean uh, airliner in 1983, and, uh, and so on. It was still able to hold Moscow Olympics, uh, the Goodwill Games. Um, and uh, uh, so um, in this sense, I would say that Russia occupies pretty much uh, the same uh, position in the world affairs, right? It's not an active shaper of the world agenda, but still an active participant, which has, I would say, some kind of a nuisance value, which can still threaten uh, and uh, interfere and work at the cracks in globalization processes uh, which appear, which are so obvious uh, from, you know, all the cleavages in, in America to Brexit uh, problems in the European Union, right-wing populism in, uh, in Europe, and, and so on. So I would say summing up, uh, wrapping up this short introduction, I would say that Europe faces pretty much the same dilemmas it had with the Soviet Union in the early 1980s. Uh, what to do with this kind of neighborhood? 
And uh, the good side, the good news here is really it's time, and I think the European politicians understand finally, that it's time to give up on the rhetoric of partnership. Russia is not a partner at this point, and this is very well also recognized and phrased in the Kremlin as well, and the, the some of the you know Lavrov's recent statement, you know I can quote uh, a recent article by Fyodor Lukyanov, uh, who is you know one of the spokespersons of the you know mainstream <coughs> foreign uh, foreign policy uh, that the European option, European choice is no longer uh, taken in Russia. So Russia should be seen as kind of a competitor by European Union. But I mean, by virtue of history, by virtue of geography, we're sitting on each other's borders. So um, we have to cooperate on certain issues, um, but this has to look more like the policy of uh, damage limitation, which once again, uh, we have inherited from the uh, 1980s. So um, uh, I would say that uh, damage limitation uh, limited engagement, uh, conditionality, uh, this kind of thing. And most importantly, is, um, uh, as Marilia had outlined at the beginning, there shouldn't be any decoupling of human rights agenda and uh, the business as usual agenda, right? The Nord Stream, the whatever, normal cooperation. So we encounter this on every possible issue. I was just in the same panel uh, about the Arctic a couple of days ago with uh, several uh, European and the Nordic speakers. And once again, we were facing the same issue. I mean, in the Arctic, does the business as goes as usual, do we just you know forget about what's happening with Alexei Navalny, with the protest movement in Moscow, and so on, or we try somehow to integrate it? Right? Are we living? Are we playing on the same chessboard? Can we just uh, do simply forget about um, uh, the obvious, uh, you know, authoritarianism and uh, massive human rights violation and uh, political prisoners and what is going on? So that's the problem with Russia. That's the problem with Belarus also at the same time. And, uh, you know, as a last thing, if you want, just by means of comparison, I think Russia is now more or less in the same situation as Belarus. So it poses the same uh, problems for the European politicians as Belarus did. So Belarus was always uh, like two, three steps ahead of Russia in uh, imposing its authoritarian regime and it's recreating a version of the Soviet Union. So Lukashenko's regime was really like a reserve of the Soviet Union, which he had created and preserved for like 20 years. But now suddenly, uh, as if in a just explosion of history in 2020, Russia has arrived into Belarus. So suddenly, you know, the two the two twin nations, as we call it, Bratsky and uh, Bratsky and Narode, the two brotherly nations, um, they have merged in a kind of a same domestic regime, domestic policies. So, and it poses uh, Europe with the same question, like what to do with Lukashenko, what to do with Putin, was the only difference that Russia, of course, has the weight, has the nuclear potential, has the hydrocarbon resources, and, and so on. So I think this is an interesting uh, agenda for us to discuss further on. And uh, yes, Marely, you, you asked the question, I think uh, in discussion, I will also then um, say a few things about the protest movement, about how people feel in Russia. But in one word, I would say this: the um, the situation is rather grim, and the sentiment is uh, obviously utmost pessimistic. Uh, and uh, for the time being, as of twenty, what is today, twenty sixth of February, twenty twenty one, uh, the opposition in Russia has been like effectively institutionally destroyed. Right? We have certain individuals, but the opposition in Russia doesn't really exist any longer at this point. And this is precisely the landscape that Kremlin was seeking ahead of the 2021 Duma elections. So this is, sorry to say, my grim outlook on the... My Thank you. Outlook. Thank you, Sergei. Actually, well, also unfortunately, probably my adjective to characterize your first statement was also exactly grim. Uh, but... Uh, but maybe we can we can find some opt optimism uh, in the question and answer session. But my short comment, maybe since you already mentioned Belarus and compared Russia as sort of you know having the same trajectory of development, we all saw how things turned out in Belarus last August. So maybe there will be another you know spark that that might actually turn the course of events that 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 we cannot actually foresee right now. Yeah, we, we have seen it. But another question: Where where Belarus is today? 
right? Well, and that's that's true. So everything. yes, yeah. it was a remarkable mobilization of society. But once again, looking at things from February 2021, I don't think this adds a lot of optimism. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, then I will move to Yulia right now, and Yulia, maybe also if you can comment a little bit on. Um, internal situation in Russia, but then again, also switch a little bit to the neighborhood uh, relations. Sure, thank you, Marile, and I will share my uh, screen and I have a presentation. Uh, okay. Mm, and, uh, all right, so now you can see, it, right? Uh, I will be talking exactly on the topics that you mentioned, uh, and uh, I should say that uh, first uh, here I represent only my personal opinion. I do not represent uh, uh, my institution. That's uh, just uh, my personal view on the uh, situation, and um, I, I would be very much interested into the discussion part because I completely disagree with Sergey on very many <laughs> Uh, points that he expressed, uh, especially on the conclusions that we have to make from the current situation. So we are discussing the same uh, facts, but from different uh, perspectives. Uh, and uh, I am uh, happy that he mentioned uh, the Soviet Union, the collapse of the Soviet Union, because I also agree that uh, this is a very important um, part of uh, history that we need to discuss uh, right now for several reasons. So first, uh, on the, um, on the uh, protests, uh, I would like to share uh, some information from the recent opinion poll conducted by the Livada Center uh, just last uh, week about public uh, attitudes towards different countries. Uh, and uh, uh, just a short uh, note that Livada is recognized as a foreign agent in Russia, which uh, should make the results more trustworthy from the European perspective and less trustworthy from the perspective of uh, Russian uh, readers. Uh, so... Uh, the attitudes towards the European Union from 2003, and as you can see, the attitudes uh, of the public opinion um, are uh, gravitating around the political agenda very much. Uh, so now, uh, but uh, since um, uh, 2019, you see that uh, there were more positive uh, rather than negative attitudes, uh, but the data doesn't go up to uh, 20, uh, 20. But I, I would like to draw your attention to the Russia-Georgia uh, conflict uh, in uh, around South Ossetia in 2008, and you can see uh, the uh, change in figures uh, after August 2008. So the political agenda does influence public attitudes uh, a lot. Uh, and uh, I would like to draw your attention to the following key conceptual issues in EU-Russia relations, because generally the topic of today's uh, uh, event, I'm sorry, of today's event is EU-Russia relations, uh, but uh, uh, we are mostly talking uh, about Russia, as I see it, uh, and not talking about uh, relations. And it takes two to tango. So I will come back to that in my in the uh, discussion part. Uh, so, uh, basically, uh, that's a debate about transitions. Uh, so how to get from point A to point B, and there are, of course, differences in, in opinion w where we are now and where do we want to get. I mean, uh, Russia, Belarus, the European Union itself. And the end of the Cold War in the last years of the Soviet Union are indeed very important uh, because the European Union uh, believes, uh, as it seems, that Western soft power led to the collapse of the Soviet Union or at least significantly contributed to that, that uh, this external influence uh, was very important. While Russian uh, domestic view is that um, all those changes were mostly domestic. They were internally uh, induced. Uh, and uh, there is a difference in approaches to drivers of those uh, changes. So according to the European Union, uh, well, if uh, we can somehow summarize that, glasnost uh, public discontent uh, led again uh, to uh, most of the changes uh, that led to the collapse of the Soviet Union and democratization. 
the view uh, in Russia is that those were elite level decisions and that's why uh, the role of Gorbachev uh, yeah, in personal attitudes towards Gorbachev were discussed uh, a lot uh, in Russia and as you know Gorbachev is not that much respected uh, by um, Russian society. Uh, and uh, it leads us to two key dilemmas in the Russia relations. Uh, so uh, the, uh, that's a dilemma and dispute about externally versus internally induced changes, like uh, how a country, how a society should change to get from point A to point B, externally or internally induced changes, and uh, what should be the drivers, society level, level or elite level drivers. Uh, and um, since Sergei already started to talk um, uh, a little bit at least uh, about the uh, position and the popular discontent, uh, I would like also to um, mention uh, this uh, um, topic of uh, revolutions uh, and I would say that uh, both uh, the European Union and the Soviet Union <laughs> used to share a romantic view on revolution. So here is a picture to illustrate that. I already uh, shared this uh, picture during my previous uh, talk. Um, uh, and uh, uh, this romanticized view of revolution uh, leads to the uh, romanticized view of what's happening in Russia around uh, Navalny. So, uh, of course, we need to look at the public attitudes. And here I uh, give some more figures from uh, Levada about the return of Alexei Navalny. That's quite a recent poll. Uh, and uh, that's um, about approval or disapproval of Navalny's activities. And as you can see in uh, 2013, most of the people uh, have not heard uh, about him. In September uh, uh, 2020 and in January uh, 2021, around 20% of uh, people approve of his uh, activities, uh, but um, if uh, we reframe this question, like how do you feel about Navalny's decision to return to Russia, uh, most of the respondents would say that uh, they are indifferent or neutral, uh, and uh, uh, those are the results from uh, open question, uh, trust in pol policymakers. Like, whom do you trust most without any options? So people could uh, say their own option. And as you can see, Navalny has from 3 to 5% of uh, support, uh, generally, uh, out of all policymakers who are known to uh, the general audiences. And uh, I think uh, that... Uh, he, in order to explain uh, the public attitudes towards uh, Navalny, we need to talk about uh, Russian economy. And Sergei already touched upon this. So I basically agree that we need to talk about some specific uh, problems, uh, but uh, interpretations might be uh, different. So uh, Navalny's major agenda is corruption and fight against uh, corruption in uh, Russia. Uh, but it seems important to me that we also try to understand the public attitude. So, of course, uh, corruption uh, is a problem uh, and people are aware about mm, this you know, problem. Uh, and even if we take official information like Rostat uh, about the share of shadow economy in Russia, uh, according the, to the official information, that's around... Uh, 12, 13 uh, percent, which is uh, a lot for uh, official uh, figures. Uh, if we take uh, alternative sources, so for example, I would quote here the project on shadow economies uh, conducted in the Stockholm School of Economics, and they explore different cases, including Ukraine, Kosovo, Romania, of course, Russia. Uh, the Baltic states, Poland, and the results on Russia for the same years as I quoted the, the, the numbers for um, Rostat uh, statistics. Uh, so also for 2017 and 2018. So according to this specific study, 
uh, the size of shadow economy in Russia is more than uh, 45% of the GDP in 2017 and a little bit less in 2018. And uh, the authors also uh, pay a lot of attention to the phenomenon of the so-called envelope wages. So uh, a lot of people get their wages in envelopes, so like unofficially, thus it means that uh, the companies do not pay taxes uh, and um, uh, people also do not pay uh, taxes. So, so that's, as you can see, also uh, almost 39% uh, in uh, 2018. And um, underreporting of the business income is also very high, you see the uh, numbers. And uh, there are also some uh, enterprises which are completely unregistered. So those are estimations of the authors. Uh, so of course, uh, we can uh, debate about the uh, methodology and so on. So uh, Sergei uh, uh, may know better the approaches to studying uh, shadow economy. Uh, and how to count that all. Uh, so my point is to draw your attention to the phenomenon when people uh, who might be mostly in need of the social support, uh, they are those exactly who uh, are uh, who participate uh, in this uh, shadow uh, economy, not because they want to, but because they uh, have no uh, other choice. And uh, those people, they do not pay taxes, but at the same time, uh, they receive uh, social services from uh, the state. Uh, and um, uh, we can interpret and then comment on this situation differently, uh, but it seems to me that that would be the answer to the question of why, why uh, the, all those questions of fighting against corruption are not so uh, popular as a topic for the uh, opposition uh, movement. Uh, so, uh, generally, my conclusion is that uh, people uh, take the situation as a kind of a tacit social contract, uh, and uh, for them, uh, corruption is something, uh, is a kind of uh, e everyday uh, phenomenon, everyday environment. Uh, and uh, it does not sound like an attractive um, political program, how to get from A to B. So that's just a constatation of the problem uh, and not uh, any program of how to solve this uh, situation, uh, which is, of course, not, uh, it cannot be assessed uh, as uh, positive developments in the economic sphere. So now I come to my conclusions. Uh, from uh, this uh, situation. Uh, so basically, Russian own uh, experience of transformation in the 80s, in the 90s, uh, and uh, until uh, now are that internally induced elite level drivers of change are the best option. Uh, and that tacit social contract between the elites and the society on the issue of corruption and shadow economy is uh, what works as a glue of uh, all uh, relations uh, within Russia. And thus, we can make conclusions, for example, for Belarus and Russian attitudes towards what's happening in Belarus. Uh, thus, Russia believes that top-down transformations like new constitution or building political parties, so that's the process which will uh, be developing during the 2021 so those transformations will work. That's the uh, Russian uh, official attitude. And uh, if we mention the events in Armenia, because we know that recently there are uh, more, uh, there's more public discontent. Uh, and if we uh, go back to the Velvet Revolution of 2018, uh, the attitude was that if the changes are not top down, but bottom up, uh, if uh, it is not el elite level drivers, but society level drivers, it is okay as long as uh, those changes are internally induced and not uh, supported by any external interference in support of those changes. Uh, so uh, that's a kind of conceptual um, approaches in the Russian uh, foreign policy. 
uh, that can explain Russian position on what's happening uh, in its neighborhood uh, in Eurasia and what can explain uh, Russian relations with the European Union. Uh, I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Yulia. Uh, very interesting remarks. Also, we can discuss what what can be considered uh, internally and externally in the exchange. This is also a question. Who thinks of what, how? Uh, but uh, I really like the point about this tacit social contract on corruption because um, I saw some statistics on the movie that Navalny released after he was arrested and that many Russians who actually watched this movie didn't believe it. Uh, it's like 30% who said they don't believe the movie, although it's like a two-hour investigation with a lot of data in it. So that's, uh, I would say that's uh, a bit worrisome, at least a little bit. But let me let me also go to Hannes right now and uh, ask him um, so about the European Union, because Sergei also mentioned in his remarks that actually there is a disillusionment between uh, the EU and Russia, that Russia is actually very different these days than it was before. And so the EU should also uh, act differently, um, maybe even uh, speak more uh, less about partnership. Uh, but maybe I would also say that the EU is also different. Uh, EU has also changed. And uh, the policies that it applied before, this normative logic of its foreign policy, it seems to be... Um, questioned by many because there are uh, problems within the European Union itself, uh, how to deal with uh, human rights violations, for example, with migrants uh, on the borders and so on. So it seems that both Russia and the EU are actually changing and, and as Joseph Borrell put in his blog uh, uh, recently, that they're drifting apart. So uh, what would you say um, can be done, should be done um, any remarks on the EU policy towards Russia? Well, thank you very much, Maria, and thank you very much uh, to Yulia and Sergei for the wonderful uh, contributions. Um, when I was still in the European Parliament and I took over the Russia report, and I um, uh, proposed that at least uh, we should strive for partnership with Russia, there was a strong discussion because uh, some people said from the beginning, no, no partnership anyway possible. Russia is not a partner, uh, not only a competitor, as Sergei said, but more or less the enemy, uh, especially when some people from uh, the Baltic countries uh, spoke, uh, even was of Romania. And uh, so the, the minimum, of course, was perhaps uh, and that was agreed that uh, Russia should become a partner. But I fully agree with Sergei, it became less and less possible to have it as a partner, general partner. That does not mean that on certain elements, cooperation is, is possible. So I think we should be more realistic, that's clear. This kind, what we have in the European Union, unfortunately, is, uh, you know, by a, a very widespread of attitudes. Uh, some people say Putin is not more than, or nothing else than, than Stalin, Some, especially from countries who have realized a very bad experience in Soviet times. And uh, the fact that uh, uh, Russia, especially with Putin, did not recognize what has happened uh, in Soviet times to some of the countries, uh, like the Baltic countries or others, and that, uh, you know, these famous words by Mr. Putin, it was the dissolution of the Soviet Union was the biggest uh, catastrophe uh, of the century. Uh, all that uh, nourished these kind of people who have a principal anti-Russian position, uh, not only anti-Putin, but maybe even anti-Russian position. And on the other hand, we have people who are still consenting to the sanctions, but uh, like Mr. Orban and others who are uh, not critical at all about uh, domestic uh, development in Russia. Um, I think what the European Union should think about is that um, any kind of transition, especially transition from dictatorial systems, as Sergei uh, characterized, will be a big turmoil and that we as European Union should also recognize that we cannot from the outside 
more or less initiate a regime change. Some people still think it is possible or it is feasible or it is even wished, but we should be more realistic. So I'm in a position between, you know, not those who are friends or what was in German is called Putin Versteher. We would like to understand Putin, but uh, it, it is meant not only to understand him, but to have sympathy. And on the other hand, those who say our biggest uh, job is to fight against uh, Putin or Russia. In some way, when Sergei characterized um, Russia today, um, it's a bit similar also to what we realize in China. Uh, the time when we had hope in Xi Jinping being more open, more Western style, his wife is a singer, so he's not the typical um, communist, Chinese communist type, it has changed. Also here we have a, a leader, a person of a structure, and of course the person is not only alone, he has some apparatus, military security apparatus, and it's a bit, uh, of course, uh, with uh, Russia. If you look at the US and, uh, and, uh, and Trump, uh, even Trump could, you know, wanted perhaps something similar, you know, a person and a small group of people supporting him. We have that kind of, of tendencies and uh, we have to recognize it is very difficult to break into the system. Now, when Sergei spoke about uh, the situation uh, similar to the 80s, the question, of course, immediately comes after the 80s came the 90s, or the end of the 80s, which was the breakdown. Uh, will that happen again? Uh, the figures shown by Yulia were different, but uh, we didn't have reliable uh, data about uh, you know, the depression of an after depression of time. Um, the difficulty from the West and Europe is, of course, how to, first of all, to evaluate what does the Navalny and the Navalny movement really mean. It's not, not always that there must be a big majority. Um, Lenin had probably not the majority at the revolution. Um, so uh, we should be more, more careful and um, things changes have to come from the inside. Uh, recently, you know, saw an um, element, for example, it's a small country, but uh, Ceausescu, there were no sanctions against him. Ceausescu was honored by the West because he was anti Russian. He was received by uh, the Queen in England. And some months later, or I think it was some months only later, you know, he was uh, pushed out and was killed by his own people. So I don't think, uh, or I do think that we should not evaluate, uh, ev uh, overvalue and um, over, -expect over expectation what the European Union could do. So I'm critical about sanctions. Also in some way, sanction is perhaps the only way to show at least that you are very critical about what happens with Navalny or other things. But I think, on the other hand, um, one should be trying to find elements of cooperation. Again, I fully agree with Sergei. It's not an um, overall partnership. That's not possible. Let's be realistic. And it will not come in a few years' time. But to say, OK, we have environmental issue. We have, Sergei meant, the Arctic. We have. Uh, a neighborhood where we share some relationship. Therefore, I'm particularly, let's say, disappointed about the development in Armenia because Armenia was, a, in a way, an example where we could, where we tried to cooperate uh, or to have a combination of having a country and a strong Russian influence, but nevertheless building up some um, more economic and political relationships with the European Union. Um, also on the energy field, you know, I, I deplore very much this, uh, again, overvalued, overestimation of the, of the uh, pipeline Nord Stream 2. We 
as Europeans, we present to Russia the picture that we are divided ourselves. We don't know what to do. Uh, we could leave it aside. It is a project doubtful. It will be of no value in perhaps 20 years' time because uh, energy situation will totally be different. But for the moment, to, just to fight on this issue, showing and knowing that we cannot be united or have a, a, a common position is absolutely showing uh, Russia, look what, what they're doing, they, these uh, weak Europeans that discuss issues which are anyway have no, have no consequence in reality and bring more divisions inside European Union than between uh, European Union and Russia. So um, there are many, many points which were, were mentioned by, by the two colleagues. Uh, again, thank you very much. But I think we should be realistic. Realistic also concerning Navalny, all this uh, expectation Navalny will bring the big revolution. I doubt it. We don't know, but I doubt that this will be the case. We should um, have a clear opinion about what is democratically acceptable or not acceptable. But as we cannot change the regime in China, we cannot regime, change the regime in, in Russia. Uh, the, the last thing is, of course, the big question now in the European Union, especially by Macron and others, is, of course, the military side of the European Union. I am um, critical, but on the other hand, of course, we have to know as long as Russia has this kind of, uh, let's say, aggressive, if I want to use this word, behavior that we saw in, in the Crimea and uh, saw at least for some time in Ukraine, um, we have two choices. Going for disarmament, which is anyway on the table again, or at least strengthen the capacity of European Union or the European side what the military element would be. So the uh, only thing I can plead is a more realistic point of view, um, less reliance on sanctions, uh, trying to find fields of cooperation and uh, less division inside European Union because uh, a weak, uh, this, uh, divided European Union, which is always discussing about these issues in the public without real action uh, will not help to overcome the situation in, in Russia. And anyway, that's, that's my, my contribution. Uh, so in some way, also Yulia mentioned that she's uh, in many disagreements with uh, Sergei. I would say in some way I'm an, in an agreement with, between Sergei and Yulia, uh, at least in trying to find a more realistic way dealing with Russia not having too many expectations that change, things will change very soon. Anyway, now we have Matthias also joining us. So maybe uh, I stop here. Exactly. Thank you very much, Hannes, and many points. And I'm very glad that you mentioned that there is some way how we can reconcile different views also inside Russia. And uh, that would be great maybe to also discuss a little bit more on that. But I would like to welcome uh, our fourth speaker who has just joined us, Matthias Dembinski, he's a senior researcher at the Peace Research Institute in Frankfurt and a member of our advisory board at the IIP. Uh, so Matthias, we are already a little bit um, behind time, so I would like to ask you to make your remarks, uh, but be brief, um, up to five to seven minutes if you can. And of course, there are many questions, you know, generally we discuss EU-Russia relations here, but maybe more specifically to you, it would be interesting to know what's the German approach and uh, maybe if what are the upcoming German elections might bring. You need to unmute yourself. First of all, sorry, I just, I, 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 I'm, I mixed up the time, so <laughs> please excuse me. <laughs> um, I will try to be very brief, and I will try to touch briefly upon the Nord Stream issue, which, which is very, very hotly debated here in Germany, and also on the consequences of uh, this year's elections for, for uh, German and Western Russian relations. Um, but before I do that, um, let me maybe just um, give you very, very briefly my take 
on uh, what went wrong in the in the uh, Western Russian relations and where we are at the point right now. Um, I mean, European Russian relations are definitely at a low point. Um, although we have a lot of um, or some some interests in common, um, we see that there is there's basically no uh, serious exchange uh, on the European level between both sides. Um, and in fact, it seems that the relationship is deeply impaired, if not dysfunctional. Uh, and in my view, this is a consequence of what we call the dissociation of Russia from, um, from a kind of a institutionalized security order that first uh, came into view with the Paris Charter and then then uh, has been con con constructed during the, during the 1990s and early 2000s. Of course, it's difficult to tell uh, when the Russian departure from this order began, uh, probably around 2007. Uh, 2014 marks the, uh, the final breakage of this relationship. Um, and I would argue that this Dissociation went hand in hand with an with an increase uh, in the level of tensions um, and with uh, resentment on both sides, which still poison also our relationship. And uh, maybe just to give you two indicators of this uh, of this dysfunctionality, as I would call it. Um, first, it seems to me it seems to me that both sides still feel the urge to harm the other. Um, and related to this is a specific style of communication, I would say, especially on the Russian side. I mean, with the denial of rather, at least in my view, of rather obvious facts like the downing of the MH17 or the poisoning of Skripal, Russia is in a certain way destroying the communicative space. And that, of course, is one of the preconditions for, for a serious dialogue. Um, even more worrying in my view, is a striking misperception in, or a striking difference in how both sides perceive the balance of powers. Um, it seems to me that Russia, I mean, in, in alliance with China, sees itself somehow on the winning side. And um, when Russians look at the West, they see a crisis, decay, and so on and so forth. The Western view of Russia is strikingly different. Um, according to this view, the former bargaining, bar bargain whereby Putin guarantees wealth and the people renounce freedom is not working anymore. Um, the Russian economy is in decline, real incomes are falling, corruption is rampant, and trust in public institution and even Putin himself uh, has reached a low point. Um, so. I mean, if both sides have these strikingly different perceptions of the balance of power, of course, something like a compromise is extremely difficult to achieve. Um, both sides are in a certain way are in a hole, but both sides keep on digging. And the next project that might go down the drain is North Stream. I mean, as, as you all know, North Stream is in limbo right now due to the American sanctions. And even if they manage to complete the, the pipeline, it is, uh, it's, very, it's very uncertain whether, whether, um, whether any gas will flow through, the, through these pipelines anytime soon. Um, uh, opposition is running very high in, uh, in, in, in Europe, but also in Germany itself. Uh, the Green Party and parts of the Christian Democrats are looking for ways to stop Nord Stream. And the parliamentary election in Germany in September will most likely result in a Christian Democratic Green coalition government and the Green Party will claim the foreign ministry. Thus, there's only a very brief time window left uh, to save this key german rush project. Um, right now, the, the German government and the Biden administration um, are in talks to find a possible compromise. Such a compromise might include a clause whereby Germany would um, 
assure that Germany would stop buying Russian gas uh, if Russia renews its aggression in Ukraine. Um, ben Fried, among others, has uh, suggested another element of such a compromise whereby German companies will continue to accept a part of the gas imports at the Russian-Ukrainian border crossing. Um, so we'll see. But um, whether such a compromise will be politically feasible depends not least on Russian actions. And of course, if Russia continues on its confrontational course, like the, like, like the way how they, how they snub Borrell and so on, or Lavrov's interview, Lavrov's recent interviews. So if Russia continues on this kind of a confrontational course, um, such a compromise will probably be untenable and um, we risk that this last major cooperation project will go down, down the drain as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matthias, um, uh, for your uh, inputs. Uh, so you also mentioned, uh, we discussed it already before you joined, that uh, there is this sort of uh, low point in the relationships be between the EU and Russia, and it's due uh, or it was triggered not only by the um, relations between the states, but also by the domestic situation in Russia and you know, how the EU reacted to it and how Russia assessed this reaction and so on. And so Hannes in this regard also said that um, um, because Sergei was arguing earlier that the regime change in Russia, um, that Russia is going into this di dictatorial regime. And Hannes said that it's not really possible to instigate a change from the outside. So we need some partners or not at least partners, but some forces inside the country who can actually make this change and then bring EU and Russia maybe on a bit similar, more similar track. So with all these uh, considerations in mind, I would also like to come again then to Sergei. And there are some questions in the uh, in the audience. And maybe if, Sergei, you want to react to some other statement before, you can do that. But maybe to a little bit focus it uh, on a question, uh, I would like to ask you with um, what I asked before. So uh, protests, Navalny arrest, are there miscalculations in the government, in the Russian government that they arrested him, or it's rather some sort of a strategy. So what do you make out of this situation? Why was why was he arrested more or less? And what what can the pro this protests result into? Okay, so uh, do I go first on the, uh, on the questions? Yes. Yeah, I see uh, the question from uh, addressed both uh, to Yulia and to me on uh, Navalny uh, from Stephanie Fancard. I don't think, frankly, uh, <clears throat> I don't think there is any significant threat to the Russian regime at this point. From inside the country, from outside the country, it is set in rock, right? Of course, we cannot uh, rule out all sort of contingency and like the Soviet Union in 1983 also set to seem to be set in stone. But frankly, this is the only thing we can... <coughs> we can uh, consolate ourselves with. I mean, we keep repeating this for the past 15 years. Ah, oh, the Soviet Union also broke up, you know, nobody expected. So let's just, you know, sit back and relax and uh, expect the regime to break up. It may take the rest of our lives while we still wait for this, uh, you know, Deus Ex Machina 1985 and the advent of some, you know, Gorbachev who accidentally celebrates uh, his 90th birthday in a couple of days on the 2nd of March. So congratulations to Mikhail Sergeyevich on this. Uh, so no, Navalny is not a threat uh, and um, his um, recognition rate among the uh, Russian population and the trust uh, in his uh, anti-corruption uh, revelations. You know, the, the problem is, and this is actually to this question, to other questions which I've seen, you know, it's not about politics. The problem is there's no politics in Russia. Just don't be mistaken, because I think, okay, here's an opposition politician, he has been detained, but then he has an agenda, and there is a movement, and there is a party, and there's a round table, and then suddenly there's politics. It doesn't happen like this in Russia. In Russia, there's just you know, one person, Putin. I mean, all Russian politics is Putin's body, and then there's nothing, right? State Duma is not about politics. Uh, you know, opposition is not about politics. So uh, Navalny uh, is uh, very important uh, in the Russian media sphere. And um, 
I mean, it's really a pain for me to say this because I really enjoyed um, and I really appreciate uh, how much the work done by Navalny. But I understand that 100 million views of his movie on Putin's uh, on Putin's palace uh, in uh, Gelenjik, it's like entertainment, right? People see this, uh, it's, it, it's a media thing. People watch this and, uh, you know, everyone on the, on the subway was watching this one day. I remember, so what? Will they go out protesting the next morning? No, they're not. I mean, as you see, half of them say, no, we don't, we don't believe it. And then, you know, there is, you know, uh, tons and tons of propaganda that goes on them uh, from the state media outlets, which uh, outperforms in many ways uh, Navalny's message. Yes, I mean, there's a significant um, percentage of urban electorate uh, in the big cities uh, behind Navalny. But in the present day Russia, like we have seen this, we've seen almost no reaction to Navalny's poisoning back in August, uh, right? Um, we haven't seen uh, anything beyond, uh, you know, a couple of thousand. Okay, there were some outstanding performances in places like Rakutsk and Omsk when, you know, thousands of people went out in the street uh, surrounded by police and minus 35 temperatures. That's really some uh, private heroism, right? But it's not scalable into the entire Russia. Khabarovsk is not scalable into the entire Russia. It's been an isolated occurrence. It's been out there for a year. And so what? No other city went out in support of Khabarovsk. She is uh, in uh, Arkhangelsk area where people have been quite successfully protesting against the uh, garbage site, the big dumping site uh, from central Russia there. Uh, it's also not scalable. Right, it's a very local story. It was kept under control, and um, it uh, never, never extended. So there are lots of some of these micro stories all across Russia. But above all, there's a huge repressive machine. There's still a very inert population, uh, and uh, there's also a population which, um, you see, there's no desperation. Uh, it's not. There's a level of uh, desperation of uh, joblessness and crisis of the Arab street uh, during the Arab revolutions uh, 10 years ago, right? Uh, there's no uh, sense of um, decay and uh, kind of uh, nothing to lose situation we've seen during the breakup of the Soviet Union. Because um, the Russian social crisis uh, is, is looming, but it's okay, it's coming in, especially the price rise this year. It will be coming in, it will be setting in once again, like in the 1970s and the 1980s. But still, people are not in a desperate situation. People still have jobs. Uh, the bank system is operable. People have credits. People uh, have, you know, mortgages. Uh, people have their small businesses. Uh, millions of people are gainfully employed in the state sector. Um, and, you know, there's this huge uh, infrastructure of, uh, uh, so to say, social stability, which will be very difficult to ruin. I don't see any impulse of, um, you know, coming that will take people out on the street and more importantly, that can, you know, uproot Putin and uh, change the regime. So in a sense, yeah, I'm very pessimistic in a sense that uh, the situation, uh, um, um, it's, it's really blocked. The only hope uh, that I hope for, for the change in, uh, in Russia is, uh, is oil. You know, bring the oil price to $10 a barrel over the next five years. And then it will be, we will see some change in Russia. So probably this is uh, the best that can be hoped for change in Russia. Anything other than this, this will be like, as I said, damage limitation, containment, uh, deterrence, uh, if you wish. But um, I don't believe that uh, there is a change to change Russia from the inside. And um, let's hope that, you know, Navalny will survive until the, until the time when the conditions for change in Russia are ripe. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Yulia wants to react or yeah. answer other questions, maybe? Uh, well, I would like to add a little bit to this one. Uh, I, uh, on this, I mostly agree with uh, Sergei about the uh, potential for any public uh, discontent, which might turn into something uh, bigger. So actually, a lot of experts in Russia believe uh, that uh, by including Navalny into the systemic opposition, 
uh, well, that would be the best way to disarm his, him and his uh, political agenda and all his movement. Because if uh, an opposition, a politician from the opposition finds himself or herself uh, within the political system, usually it's very difficult to continue uh, this opposition uh, agenda. You need to uh, uh, take upon routine uh, bureaucracy, a lot of uh, actions, and uh, until the re-election, you will need to show some results. And it uh, and uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, if uh, uh, Navalny had been uh, elected, he, he would not. Uh, he would become uh, probably less popular. So I, I'm not sure. That's just a, a guess uh, based on the uh, comments uh, from uh, different uh, experts uh, based in Russia. And uh, generally, for Navalny, uh, like he gains much more attention by remaining in the uh, opposition and remaining out of the political system. So in, from this perspective, both uh, the political elites uh, and uh, Navalny, they get what they want exactly from this uh, situation, like uh, from the perspective of kind of a game theory or whatever. Uh, but the key question here is exactly like uh, how to uh, progress from the perspective of economic development, societal development, and so on. So what can bring about any positive change and who should initiate it. And uh, I think the major conclusion that we need to make from our today's discussion is that we need to look beyond uh, just uh, the discussion of uh, uh, elites, opposition. Uh, so uh, that's a much more complex uh, issue. Um, I do not have any immediate answers. I, I just uh, suggest to uh, discuss uh, more specific uh, economic uh, aspects and drivers uh, for uh, improvement. Thank you, Julia. Any other comments from Hannes or Matthias? Hannes? Very briefly, I mean, there's also this question. Uh, Ron Willis, uh, what will happen to Russia when nobody wants to buy oil and gas anymore? And that, of course, comes to the, the, the remark of Sergei. Uh, for the time being, I mean, uh, we see the oil price is rising again, and that, of course, helps Russia. Uh, and for many years, uh, still, uh, uh, countries and companies will buy gas and oil from Russia. And I think uh, uh, that's unavoidable. Of course, the transition, especially in Western Europe and some other countries, away from oil at least, and then finally also from gas, to a more sustainable, um, or less uh, or zero carbon economy, will bring problems to Russia. And I think um, one of the biggest issues, I think, is that the transformation of the Russian economy uh, into a modern service economy is uh, very slow and much too low uh, and will bring problems to Russia. The fact that Russia uh, developed Sputnik quite soon and uh, it seems quite successfully uh, does not mean that uh, the economic, uh, let's say, transition is working. Uh, I have my doubts that it, it is working. Of course, there are specific sectors where Russia um, may also show excellency in this case. And of course, this is our, our case where Russia used it uh, uh, politically because all we know is that there is not uh, too much uh, vaccination uh, activities in Russia itself, beyond some big cities, but uh, Russia is very active and, and, and successfully selling um, and bringing the vaccination to other countries. So, uh, for the time being, this is the fact. So uh, yes, in the long in the long run, uh, there will be the necessity to modernize the economy, especially. Uh, but again, for the European Union, uh, as Julia and other mentioned, there is no big stick we have in our hand uh, to to you know to to beat uh, Putin or his regime and even all the sanctions against uh, some of the friends of Putin, maybe they are politically necessary, but we should not uh, combine with these kind of sanctions the hope 
that this will change dramatically the situation in Russia, as we should not combine the fact that Navalny is put into prison and there are some demonstrations, in bigger demonstrations than in other cases, that this will change automatically. So again, and this could be my final words, let's be realistic, uh, let's uh, criticize what has to be criticized, but at the same time, let's find ways of cooperation, especially also on the environmental issue. Finally, uh, the global uh, warming is not an issue we can do uh, without China, but also uh, Russia should be part of it. Uh, and uh, to, be, to concentrate more on what we Europeans can do for peace and stability in our country and not what we can do to change the regime in, in Russia uh, would be helpful and uh, would be more successful. Thank you, Hannes. Um, so I, I saw there are some questions in the chat, actually, but they were more or less answered already by Julia. Thank you. And uh, then I would like maybe to address this question to Matthias uh, from Heinz Gärtner. He's asking, how do you see Helsinki, the Helsinki process? Was it a success or a failure? And maybe in addition to that, maybe you can already compare it a little bit to the current situation. Is maybe another Helsinki possible or uh, in which direction are we moving right now? Please unmute yourself. Uh, sorry, I didn't get this question correctly. Can you repeat it? Do you see the Helsinki process and the, the Tenta process during the East-West conflict as a success or a failure? Um. I mean, the, the Helsinki process was definitely a success. The question is, can we, can we repeat it somehow, right? Um, and he, he, at, 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 at some point in history, we will probably be able to repeat this, but I'm not sure whether we are there already. Um, I mean, as, I, as, I, as I've mentioned, I, I mean, my, my feeling and my reading is that both sides still have the fantasy. I'm not buying into this, but both sides have the fantasy that somehow history is on their side and that they might be able to prevail on this conflict if they are, if they stick to their point, if they deny any compromises and so on and so forth. Um, so first of all, I think we probably need an acceptance here on our Western side that we can't change Russia, Russia or, the, or the Putin regime just by pressure from the outside. And we probably would also have uh, this, this understanding on, on, the, on the Russian side that NATO and the West and the European Union are there to stay. They will not go away. Um, and so they, we both have to deal then with, these, with each other. I think we have, we, 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 um, I mean, the best we can hope for right now is is that we are able to stabilize this situation of coexistence where we are in. And to do that, I guess we would need a dialogue on at least three issues. First of all, of course, threat perceptions and arms control. Secondly, uh, kind of uh, ground rules that define the what is allowed uh, in terms of uh, interference in international affairs. And thirdly, and most importantly, most difficult, we would probably need uh, talks and an agreement on the relationship between the Paris Carter principles of common security on the one hand and the freedom of all states to join alliances on the other. Um, and I think in this way, we probably might be able to well, to stabilize this uh, situation of coexistence that, that we are into and to kind of create a more constructive relationship. Julia, you wanted to react. Please go ahead. Um, thank you. Uh, I agree that the Helsinki process was a success because it was a, an institutionalization of the conflict. And uh, generally, both uh, parties, uh, both sides uh, did uh, understand that, that the conflict remains, but we just have better procedures, better instruments how to deal with the um, uh, conflict. So uh, from that perspective, uh, indeed, we might need some uh, platform uh, for uh, discussing 
uh, the common agenda, for example, the issues uh, mentioned by Matthias or any other issues in uh, the uh, institutions like uh, Russian NATO Council uh, were exactly aimed at uh, creating such a platform. Uh, and uh, all Russian uh, suggestions about Greater Eurasia Project or uh, common economic and uh, uh, social space from Lisbon to Vladivostok uh, or draft European Security Treaty, uh, those are uh, the similar attempts of creating a kind of an infrastructure or platform for discussion of issues of uh, common uh, interest. Um, the EU doesn't seem to be interested and claims that we already have the OSCE, so why to create uh, any uh, new platforms? Uh, so, um, generally it did work previously, it might uh, work uh, in the future uh, if this question uh, well, we might say if the question is less politicized, but uh, in the 70s, it was even more politicized, and we did manage <laughs> to overcome all those politi all this uh, politicization. Um, so I, I do not have an answer whether it will work uh, in the future, but I can uh, tell you that uh, from the perspective of the uh, official Russian foreign policy, and that might touch upon another question that I see in, uh, in the chat, uh, that actually Russia still suggests uh, to, uh, that Russia and the EU should cooperate on common economic and social space, create a free trade uh, area, either within the Greater Eurasia uh, project or any, any other possible ways to cooperate on the economic uh, issues. And uh, Russia didn't take back uh, its suggestions. They are still uh, on the agenda. So th that would be my advice to the... Russian foreign policy to continue with that uh, and uh, do, do not uh, try to uh, make uh, its um, uh, rhetoric uh, more uh, assort assertive towards the EU. Uh, let, me, let me just say that Hannes will go next afterwards, Sergei, and please, uh, can you also uh, make your concluding remarks to that? Yeah, thank you. I wanted to have it already done, but as Yulia mentioned it, I think one should be very clear. Uh, the development must be different and cannot be some sort of a repetition of Helsinki. Why? We have conflicts, direct conflicts in Ukraine, uh, still Moldova, Georgia. Uh, so I think it is not, uh, uh, at Helsinki it was more or less the borders were clear, now they are not clear. But I agree what uh, Julia said, and it would be very difficult to convince the EU, but it must do or should do, to have a dialogue between the two economic fields, the European Union and uh, the, the Eastern um, Association, Economic uh, Association. Because otherwise, um, of course, the European Union has a different strengths and capacity. But I think this uh, negation or the decline of the European Union to go into a, that kind of dialogue is wrong because if we want to solve the issues, uh, as, it, as the, I mentioned them as well, I think we have to have this kind of overall dialogue on all the fields, of course, security, uh, politics, but especially because here we can have the biggest success on the question of economic development. And in there comes, of course, also China, because this is a, uh, still the big elephant in the room, that for both China, of course, is an important, let's use the word partner, or let's say uh, actor with whom we should cooperate. I think um, we cannot avoid, avoid it. So that, that would be my conclusion in, in, in fully supporting what Julia said. Uh, let's have a new field where we can start a, a, a cooperation. Uh, the, the idea or the fantasy that uh, Europe can take over, everything is wrong. And let's not forget, and forget, and this is the last, in the past 20 years, the European Union was extending its influence. Russia could not, and what Russia is doing or was doing now is, of course, partly a reaction we are not European and the liberal democracy as such are not on the losing side. 
because uh, we could extend our influence. Of course, Russia reacted by stopping a further extension. And I think we have to have a new strategy now in, uh, in cooperation between the two spheres of influence, if you want to say, European Union and the, the uh, Russia Asian community. And then, of course, maybe together have some alliance also or some strategic cooperation with China. That would be my final words. Thank you, Hannes. Uh, uh, yes, uh, actually, I, I too would like to uh, jump in briefly on the question of the uh, Helsinki Agreement and the uh, uh, data. And this is profoundly 20th century. I, I would say that's like, okay, boomer. That's, uh, that's, that's the 20th century thing. It could only happen at the, in the conditions of the Cold War. When there were blocks, there was block discipline, there was state sovereignty. Uh, there was like delegated sovereignty and, um, you know, there was a bipolar confrontation. The world was ruled according to uh, certain uh, principles and uh, rules. There were certain rules of engagement between 1945 and 1991. And there are absolutely none of them now, right? Because uh, not only we don't have uh, blocks, at least on the, on the, on the Russian side, uh, but also um, in terms of security action, it's so non status now. If you look at Russia, I mean, there's uh, the hybrid warfare that has been so gainfully employed by, by Putin and uh, uh, by, by Russia in this thing. For instance, okay, there's a poisoning uh, somewhere in one of the uh, European capitals, right? Say, it's, it's not us. There's some Russian tourists that went on a tour to see a local cathedral and they somehow just engaged in poisoning. But I mean, who can say there is a state behind it? Or well, there is, for instance, a private military company operating in, in Central African Republic or in Libya. It's not Russia. It's just, you know, Chesna Away and the company, a private military company of a certain Wagner, right? So already you saw this in Crimea, right? It's not Russian invasion in Crimea. This is just, you know, the local, uh, uh, the local uh, militia that had bought uh, the equipment at William Tork, at military equipment store. So, and in, in, in these conditions, uh, it's, uh, it's impossible to take, uh, to hold states responsible. And, and therefore, it's impossible to have an all-encompassing agreement with a certain state. So Helsinki would not uh, work any longer. And um, what will happen to Russia when nobody wants to buy oil and gas anymore? I, I think this will be, uh, I mean, that, that's funny, but this will be the end of the current country, uh, the end of the current regime. Not, not of the country, uh, but of uh, the current uh, state uh, system, the system of rents, the system of resource distribution, the system of allegiances, and the system of elites. Because for all the beautiful talk of politics, interests, and so on, Russia is basically, uh, how was it, Mitch Romney say that, uh, you know, a gas station with nuclear missiles? So basically, I mean, I'm... Um, I hate to say it, I mean, it's my country, but that's, that's, that's the definition. It's basically uh, it's, it's a gas station. And uh, uh, the, um, once uh, there is no, nobody stops by a gas station, when there is no longer, I think, uh, these reserves, these ultra reserves, which are there in Russia, they will last for a couple of years. And um, it's, it's amazing how uh, Russia had a tremendous 20 years from 1998 of a high oil prices. And absolute, this was time absolutely wasted to diversify the economy away from the resource expert. Russia is a petrol state in the worst possible sense of the word. And if there's any single uh, bill to be, to be sent to Putin on uh, the results of his presidency, this is just one would be the biggest. Because uh, everyone goes to diversification. Kazakhstan does. Saudi Arabia does. Right? Everyone invests in the green economy. In Russia, it's nothing. All Russian politics of the past 20 years was about just dividing the resource spoils. That's it. So once the pipeline ends, the current Putin's Russia ends. That's really so. The end, the, end, the, end, the, end, the end of the story. So yes, there will be the country, there will be... Uh, relatively educated population, big cities, multi-million cities, some small infrastructure. But if you look at the structure of the GDP, the structure of experts and the structure of rents, this is oil and plus, you know, some natural resources. 
uh, which are traded on the world markets and the prices of which are widely linked to oil. So yes, this is a pretty black and white story, a very one dimensional story and uh, really very funny looking in the 21st century. Matthias, would you like to add a couple of words as a conclusion? Uh, first of all, I would like to share this general sense of pessimism that I that I that I heard here. Um, um, I mean, there are so many there, there, there are a couple of structural structural problems that prevent real communication and a real attempt to find compromises. Um, in the West, a lot still depends on the United States. And uh, I, uh, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm not hopeful, but um, I mean, I see at least a possibility that the current Biden administration, um, as it starts to focus on China as their main rival, will slowly change their attitudes towards Russia. Um, but and and this and and this might up uh, this, this might open up possibilities for uh, for 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 changes in Europe as well. Um, but again, this is uh, this is uh, this is only a very a very s s slight and 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 uh, possibility. And I'm not I'm, I'm I'm not sure whether we should actually build on it. I mean. I always try to be optimistic. Um, so um, this is this is where where I will put my hope. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I think we should close here already. Uh, although a lot has not been said yet, uh, although a lot also has been. Uh, we the title of our discussion was EU Russia relations and how to deal with each other, but we mostly as a result of this discussion focused uh, more on Russia than on the EU and treated the EU more or less as this uh, actor who observes what's ha what happens in Russia and uh, just thinks of it, but um, how can it act? And so uh, my sort of conclusion out of it of, from what you said is that uh, we still should aim for cooperation in some sort of ways, maybe not all of you completely agree, with uh, with what kind of cooperation it can be and how we can, you know, tie issues together, whether they should be tied, where whether we should treat economy and human rights separately, and so on. Um, and another conclusion, or rather, a bigger question is: uh, What is Russia today? What is the EU today? And uh, can we compare it to what happened in the 20th century? And can can what happened back then in terms of cooperation can it be repeated? Um, today. So with these big questions, I would like to close and thank to all of you um, for your really great inputs and really lively discussion. It was very interesting for me also personally to listen to you. So uh, thank you very much again. And I hope we can see each other one day also in person at another event. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.